Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. Interesting program. We had an hour one with Joel Chernoff from the MJAA.org, the Messianic Fellow, American Fellowship of uh, Messianic Believers and their work in Israel. Um, and, of course, we have to kind of qualify that by saying that the State of Israel was founded in unbelief by members of the Russian Communist Party and by Sabbatean Jews, but there was a tiny seed of Torah Jews, Messianic believers, and Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, that still cling to uh, the, the faith and understanding, which is why Falasa Jews in Ethiopia actually accept Messiah. And that's an interesting thing, because we're going to deal with chapter 31 today with Jonathan Gray. He's on twice a month, usually the first and third uh, Tuesdays of the month, and hour number three. And we're in page 30, chapter 31, around page 404 of The Forbidden Secret. Amazing set of books. You need to go there if you want to really understand a lot of what we call it, powerful and esoteric topics. The uh, list of books by Jonathan Gray are, are right at the peak of knowledge if you want to really understand them. They're all ebooks too, so you can order them by going to beforeus.com, B E F O R E U S.com. Jonathan, let's uh, get into this uh, chapter 31, The Sacrifice, Blood, and Water, and how it ties in with what's going on today. Yes, uh, this zeroes in on the crucifixion of, of Jesus himself, and, and a few aspects of it which uh, will be of interest and help to, I think, uh, a few people that are listening today. Now, uh, crucifixion itself was a very brutal form of, uh, of execution. Uh, it included all that pain and death can present to a victim. Absolutely ghastly and horrible. Uh, it would include dizziness, cramp, thirst, starvation, sleeplessness, traumatic fever, tetanus, not to think of the shame and the publicity of shame, the long continuance of torment and horror, and the anticipation as a victim hung day after day on a cross, uh, mortification of untended wounds, and all intensified just up to the point at which they could be endured at all, but stopping short of the point that would give the sufferer relief of unconsciousness. This is the effects of crucifixion uh, when a person was hanging on a cross. Uh, the unnatural position made every movement painful. The lacerated veins and the crushed tendons throb with incessant pain and the wounds inflamed by exposure gradually gangrene the arteries, especially at the head and the stomach, and uh, became swollen and oppressed with surcharged blood. And uh, this misery kept on increasing and, and uh, there was added to this the intolerable pang of a burning and raging thirst. Uh, and uh, it, the whole thing would have made the prospect of death itself, uh, that unknown enemy that we shudder at most, bear the aspect of a delicious and exquisite release. Uh, and uh, crucifixion was the most brutal form of execution ever invented by mankind, Bill, as you know. Yeah, in fact, uh, what's interesting is the... <clears throat> worst way to die, people should understand this, the worst way to die is suffocation. And yeah. the primary effect of crucifixion is suffocation. The next worst way to die is starvation, where the body eats itself. And the third worst way to die is an exquisite, excruciating pain that causes cardiac arrest. But the worst way to die is actually to be suffocated. And this involves suffocation very, very slowly. And it's, yeah, it's and not the rapid suffocation, but yeah, suffocation where literally the body tries to pull yourself up to try to, to open up the ribs to breathe, and eventually you get so exhausted you can't, so then you're trying to do diaphragmatic breathing, and because of the position that you are when you're crucified, you can't use the diaphragm to move either, so eventually you get more and more hypoxic and more and more weak, so it is the most cruel form of death ever invented. It's yeah, more cruel than cruel. filleting and ripping your skin off your body. It's more cruel than burning uh, someone to death and, on a stake. It's more cruel than you know, being drawn and quartered. It's more cruel than uh, literally being pulled apart with your arms and legs by animals in different directions. The slow suffocation over a number of hours combined with the dislocation of your shoulders and your joints because of the way they crucify is the cruelest form of death ever invented. And here we have the 
uh, the form of death that uh, Yeshua was willing to go through for each one of us. And I do believe that if just one of us had been the victim of sin and, and, and had fallen into sin, he would have made that supreme sacrifice just for any single one of us. But he, and he did it. He did it. And his sacrifice is adequate for all of us. Yeah. Now, this is important to understand it because we're coming to a time right now during the Feast of Tabernacles. And Tabernacles is, is a very important time where I believe that the first day of Tabernacles or Sukkot will be the first of the last seven years once the peace treaty is final, finally signed and they believe a false sigh of relief that they have peace. The middle of the course of the last seven years will be the Passover, which is the time when this Jewish sacrifice is getting ready. At the same time, Jesus is being prepared to be the Passover lamb, which was prophesied in Isaiah. So it's interesting that he is the Passover lamb. Uh, and, of course, it's interesting that he was taken down from the cross by the, the centurions and his legs were not broken. That was also prophesied that his legs wouldn't be broken as well. That is right, yes. Uh, in fact, in that last 24 hours, he fulfilled at least 40 Old Testament prophecies right to the last letter. Yeah, exactly. And that afternoon in Jerusalem... A man clothed as a priest was inside the, the, the old city and he was about his temple duties preparing the Passover lamb for slaughter. Uh, and as you said, it's the, it was the annual Passover celebration and around 3 p.m. in the afternoon, in accordance with Jewish custom, and we have that testified by Josephus, the eminent historian, at that time of the afternoon, around 3 o'clock, the priests were to kill the Passover lamb. But this day, this priest was troubled. Just, just put yourself in the picture there. Something very strange was happening out there on a hill to the north on Skull Hill, the place of execution. An eerie darkness had fallen just three hours ago at midday, and it had spread far and wide, even over the city. Uh, but he could not be distracted by it. He continued his work. And in his beautiful robe, that priest stood with his lifted knife, ready to slay the lamb for the ceremony. And suddenly the earth shook, and there was a loud, sharp, ripping noise from inside the building. The priest gets such a fright, he drops his knife from his trembling hand, the lamb escapes, and in terror and confusion he rushes inside the first chamber, and looking ahead he sees that massive curtain which separates the first room from the second has been torn as though by unseen hands violently from top to bottom. And the most holy place, which was off limits to everyone except the high priest, now lay exposed to the view of all. Just imagine how startling that was, that great veil that had been torn, not from bottom upward, as a man would have done it, but from top to bottom. You could call it, if you dared, supernatural. Yeah, and in fact, this is not a mild secret. curtain either. This is a very Pardon? heavy curtain. The curtain was made of... Uh, of uh, cowskins, which are basically these uh, uh, sea creatures that we call, what are they called, uh, what's the term for them? The uh, And of course, they, 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 it's leather. In other words, you're pulling a curtain that's multiple layers of leather with, with golden rings at the top of them. From top to bottom, it's many yards long. That's just, the force required is unbelievable, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, humanly impossible. It, it, yeah. it would only be on a, a, of a supernatural nature. And I understand Josephus says somewhere that the great veil of the temple was about three inches thick. And you had many layers, as you described, very, very thick. Right. It would have taken a team of bullets to tear it. Right. Amazing. Quite remarkable. Again, uh... Interesting, we're talking about the tabernacles this today. Back in just a moment. Back and um, 
Let's continue with Chapter 31, and I'm pressed we'll get into Chapter 32 today. It looks like we're moving along very nicely. Yes. Um, now, we're talking about the uh, the temple veil being torn from top to bottom, and this, of course, is in the Gospels. The record of it is in, in Matthew, Matthew 27, 51. Um, and always cautious, I resolved to track down, if possible, whatever sources outside the New Testament might be available. And I was in in Western Australia at the time, and an obvious help I, I thought would be a Jewish rabbi. So I, I recall it was an Australian midwinter Sunday afternoon, and I, I still remember the date. It was June the 29th. I went to the home of Rabbi Rubensarks, and the rabbi ushered me into a study, crammed with books, mostly on the shelves, but also he had big piles neatly stacked along the wall. And I came to the point and I said, Rabbi, do you know anything about the tearing of the veil of the second temple? He looked surprised at how direct I had been. And I said, it's supposed to have occurred early in the first century of the Christian era at the time of Passover. Well, he was taken aback at first, but he recovered his composure. And then he said very guardedly, but with honesty, he said, yes. There is an unwritten Jewish tradition that the veil was torn mysteriously at that time. Well, I thought that's the only admission I needed. That was a pretty good one from one who doesn't believe in Yeshua. Right. And uh, it was torn mysteriously. In other words, it was not a, a not an explanation that could be given that for, as for a human source that caused it to happen. Right, and of course that fits in with why the the the, the uh, large number of the Jews, and this is from Barry Charmish, who is a Israeli citizen and 100% Jewish, has stated that at least half of the Jews in the world followed Shabtai Tzvi, and 50 years later, Jakob Frank, uh, that literally became Catholics. The Shabtai Tzvi himself converted to become a Muslim, and uh, but still a lot of people adhered, and he actually had an anti-Messiah, anti-complex to every single uh, commandment. And so people don't understand that even back at the time of Jesus, between the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they had already formed the synagogue of Satan. Jesus announced them they are vipers and of the synagogue of Satan. People don't understand that. The state of Israel was founded as a fig tree without fruit. But yet there was yeah. a seed. There's a little seed of Torah Jews and believers, which is why, just like the same judgment over Sodom and Gomorrah, God has was restrained full judgment on Israel. Uh, because of this tiny seed of believers there. And, of course, the Israeli government are not happy about it. That's why they don't want the Falasha Jews to return to Israel. Uh, Joel talked about this in the first hour. They're trying to help the Torah Jews, uh, and they're trying to help the Christians and even the Arabs there. Many, of, By the way, the largest number of Christians in Israel are Arab. Interesting, hey? That's very interesting, yeah. Well, here we have the, the, the veil being torn. Jewish tradition uh, acknowledges that fact, a supernatural tearing of the veil, and uh, we now go outside the city. At the same moment that the veil was torn, Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished or it is completed. And from now on, temple sacrifices would be meaningless. The symbol was meeting its fulfillment in the death of the Lamb of God. And the Messiah had completed the work that was given him to do, it had been planned from the beginning of the world, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and every step in the plan of rescue had been completed according to schedule. Now, it's interesting that um, during Jesus' ministry, they had, well, first of all, Lucifer had tried to uh, overthrow his plan by uh, getting him to fall in temptation in the wilderness. Then 11 times during his ministry that I've been able to find, there were attempts on his life, but as the scripture says, his time had not yet come. And Jesus' victory now was assured. In his death, he cried out, it is finished. And I can imagine a shout of triumph ringing through the heavens. The contest that had been so long in progress was now decided in the favor of Jesus, the conqueror. And what happened that day to parallel the ancient sacrificial system was almost startling. You know, on the annual Hebrew Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the high priest would go to the Holy of Holies with the blood of a sacrificed animal. He'd sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat, which represented the throne of God. And after three hours in the darkness of the most holy place, the high priest would come out with the empty basin, hold it up and proclaim, It is finished. 
Then the people knew that the sacrifice had been accepted by God and their sins were forgiven. Let's fast forward now to the time of Yeshua on the cross. Three hours in darkness on the cross from midday till three o'clock. And he ends it with a triumphant cry, it is finished. He's done all he could. We now had a means of rescue opened up to us. In other words, the, the parachute was now completed. It would still require us to pull it and, and to respond, but the means of rescue was there. Right. By the way, the means of rescue means it's completely different than any other religion on earth that has been either invented by man before Jesus or after. That the only rescue is not to do things for God, but to develop a relationship with God and then to do things once that relationship exists. That's right. You, you and don't in the you don't rescue plan, our individual response is very crucial. Right. It's our response that actually creates a relationship. That's why people say, well, but the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper occurs after death. The marriage occurs during your life. Yeah, that's right. In other words, are you... Now are Jesus you a, gives a final yeah. cry with a loud voice, Father, I commit my spirit into your hands. And uh, he was victor. He now had become conscious of a triumph and confident of his own resurrection. And immediately there was a fearful rumbling sound erupting from below the earth, and the ground shook violently and the rocks were split, we were told. And from the startled Roman centurion was forced those words, truly this man was the Son of God. Now, uh, we, we know that uh, from uh, the descriptions of crucifixions uh, through history that it was a slow process, uh, death by crucifixion, and a victim could linger on for days. And uh, the soldiers who were attending the crucifixion were a special dispatch assigned to crucifixions. They were familiar with crucifixion scenes. They were shocked that Jesus was dead already. The priests wanted to be sure Jesus was dead, so at their suggestion, a soldier thrust a spear up his side. And if we're careful about reading the Gospel of John, we'll notice something interesting that he says. Uh, he says, One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and blood and water flowed out. I saw all this myself and have given an accurate report so that you can believe. And he says the soldiers did this in fulfillment of the scripture that says not one of his bones shall be broken and they shall look upon him whom they pierced. Now the point we made earlier was that no bones were broken and that's why the Passover lamb was not to have any bones broken because it prefigured the, the death of Jesus. But the other side of, of the, the, um, the prophecy is that he was to um, be pierced. They shall look upon him whom they have pierced. And out flowed two copious and distinct streams, one of blood, the other of water. Uh, and this was noted by those that stood by. Perhaps we'll go on from that in a moment. When we come back, we'll hear more analysis of these amazing facts. Again, remember, this is the week of the Feast of Tabernacles. Back in a moment. Welcome back, and uh, you mentioned a very interesting medical fact, uh, Jonathan, that we want to get into now. Uh, the uh, you mentioned uh, Dr. James Houghton, MD, and his his discovery, which explains what happened with the blood and water. Can you expand on that? Because it's interesting; these medical facts actually fulfill prophecy and explain the medical process that occurred at the time. Yes. Um, and the interesting thing is, John was very careful about saying, "I was a witness to the fact that blood and water flowed out, two copious and distinct streams, one of blood, the other of water." Now, this was evidence, the final evidence that they knew Jesus was dead. And it's also evidence that Jesus' death was not due to physical exhaustion, not due to the pains of crucifixion or the spear thrust. His heart had literally burst. And that sudden cry with a loud voice at the moment of death, recorded by Matthew, and the stream of blood and water that flowed from his side, recorded by John, declared that he died of a broken heart. 
Uh, now, the muscles of the heart may have been actually torn. It can happen under intense mental strain. And, and you mentioned the, these doctors. Well, uh, one's Dr. Walsh, he's a professor of medicine at the University College London. And he testified that in heart rupture, the hand is carried to the front of the chest, a piercing shriek is, is emitted, and usually death follows very quickly after that. Blood escapes into the cavity of the pericardium, the heart sac that is, and uh, this has been found in cases of rupture of the heart to contain two, three or four or more pounds of blood accumulated within it, but separated into red blood and the limpid serum, the blood and the water. So there you have what John testified about. Uh, and another doctor, uh, Sava, reported that he had experimented with uh, dead bodies less than six hours after death, and uh, he was able to prove that when a lance is thrust into the side of the chest, fluid from the pericodium, the cardium and the heart will flow the space around the lung rather than ooze its way slowly across the pierced lung to the wound in the chest wall. Now, Sava, in his opinion, Jesus, a blood and water would have gathered just inside the ribcage between the pleura, which lines the chest, and the pleura lining the lung. And he also suggested that the, the scourging a few hours before he was crucified was enough to cause an accumulation of body fluid inside the chest. Uh, another medical missionary, John Wilkinson, analysed and assessed the different theories that uh, he, he had at his disposal, and he concluded that the blood and water... Uh, uh, separation was due to the gravity and the vertical position of the body on the cross. He noted that the blood remains fluid for some time after death and he concluded that the lance must have pierced the lower part of the heart cavity. And on the basis of his medical experience with severe injuries, uh, he was in agreement that the water, so called, that John refers to, originated also in the pericardial sac. And this fluid he described as thin, clear, and colourless, and quite distinct from the thick, opaque red blood it accompanied. The conclusion was that the, the spear of the soldier at the crucifixion released the fluid, and in penetrating the heart also released the blood, which came out first. So that was an interesting observation. Yeah, really is. Now, but what would be the theological uh, explanation of the blood and water? What would you uh, say would be the, the uh, symbology there? Symbology is this, uh, and, and it's, it's tied to the physical as well. The, I think it goes right back, it starts to go back to the night before in the Garden of Gethsemane when uh, he, uh, he struggled with his uh, determination to go ahead with what lay in front of him for our sake and uh, nothing deterred him from that and on the cross it simply culminated in the fact that uh, his heart was broken now etern in eternity the father and son had been inseparable you might say like father like Siamese twins and while here on earth during his ministry Jesus had had spent whole nights in prayer uh, in communion with the father because he and the Father were virtually one in spirit and uh, uh, inseparable. Now on, the, and now on the cross, we have Lucifer and, and his, his angels pressing around in the darkness saying, now, you had it now, you've got all the sins of the world upon your shoulders, and you think you're going to rise from this? No, you're going down to a grave from which there's no resurrection. And the seemingly... Uh, the seeming black wall of separation between God who is holy and man who is unholy, which Jesus was carrying on his shoulders uh, and appeared to, uh, to eventually be going to end in eternal death for him that we might be alive, that feeling of separation, that feeling of eternal separation from God as he lived, as he lived and died as a man on the cross, that feeling of eternal separation and, and black nothingness in the future led him to utter that piercing cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I do believe, Dr. Bill, that's what broke his heart. It was the, 
the, the uh, sensing and the experiencing of the separation that comes from sin, being upon one, uh, and in the judgment, though, that's what the guilty sinner will feel. But he went through that, and he took that upon himself so that we could be spared of it. Uh, what Jesus uh, said that when I return you shall be as I am and what he's really saying is when you do it to the least of my brothers and sisters you do it to me so when someone is separated by, from God and they don't have a relationship from God in this life they're actually in a hellish situation already they just don't they're not physically aware of it because their body's not dead and what Jesus felt at that moment of his physical death was a separation of those who he was empathic with who he knew that were going to reject God and have eternal separation, and literally not only the death of the physical body, but of the soul. Because you see, yeah. a lot of people think that the soul is eternal. The soul is not eternal. The soul can suffer the second death. It can be annihilated. It may take forever to annihilate it, but that separation is immediate, and that separation is biting. That's why his heart broke, because it didn't break just because of the physical, because he was a strong physical man. It broke because of the understanding of the physical separation of the death of those people who should be children of the Most High God that were about to be annihilated. And that, that, that's it? not the ordinary death we all die. It's the final death of separation, yes. Yeah. Separation from God. And Jesus tasted that death in immeasurable agony to save us from it. Right. How could one ever deserve such a person as Jesus? My, uh, I, I, I just bow down to him I, 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 I have to humble myself before him what am I worth without him and how could he ever have done that for me how could I ever deserve that to be done for me well, we don't Jesus actually deserve literally that's the, as well as metaphorically died of a broken heart well, see that's the point is every other religion including those that are scientific transhumanism all think that they can become as gods whether it's genetic and cybernetic enhancement or bowing down five days for, times a day for prayer, or going through various ceremonies, or passing, you know, paying for dispensations like during the Middle Ages in the Catholic Church. There is no such thing as reaching up toward God. They're simply getting a relationship with God because we don't deserve anything, the other words. God just basically says, if you condescend that I am Lord, I will transform you. And he does a transformation from the outside, from the inside out. He doesn't clean the outside of the bowl and says, oh, you're fine now, you look great because you've got white clothes on. He said, you know, that, that to, the, to the rabbis, you are white, white, whitewashed graves, but inside are dead men's bones. In other words, bones that aren't going to be resurrected. Souls that are not going to survive in the eternal. And people yeah. think, well, that, that has nothing to do with survival of mankind. Sure it does. If man, as we reach across the stars in the next thousands of years, uh, with our advanced technology, will be a plague on the cosmos. And the creator of the universe won't allow, allow that. We have been, in a sense, quarantined. And the only way that God will allow mankind to advance is if we're advanced as a spiritual being, where we are empathic with each other. As he said, worship the Most High God with your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So he was empathic, and at his moment of death, his heart broke for those who will be separated from the creator forever. That's important. So we consider bombing Iran and doing these things so to pray for Islam that they repent. Welcome back, and uh, this is important. When we have uh, IQ Al Rosulian, who is a Palestinian, uh, and he releases and puts out information tomorrow in the third hour, he has 26 fatwas on against him. Now remember, most of the Muslims on earth that are of Arab or Middle Eastern descent were originally Christians or Hebrews that were converted at the point of a sword in jihads to actually serve Islam, which is a satanic religion. Now, people want to be inflamed by that. It's the truth. And uh, people like uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad that just recently met and received an award from the Torah Jews because there's a large Jewish Torah community in Iran, including 50,000 in Tehran alone, that don't believe the state of Israel should exist. They stick to the strictness of the scriptures, which is Messiah is, not, is supposed to come first before the great Aliyah. And in fact, what's happened is God's purposes are that the state of Israel would be founded as Jesus approached the fig tree, and when he saw it, he cursed it uh, because it had no fruit. And we have a state of Israel that has no fruit. They even reject uh, believers that come from Russia and the diaspora that convert to become believers, and they persecute them just like the Falasha Jews. Uh, and they certainly persecute Messianic Christians inside Israel. I know I have friends there. So 
what we have here is the renting of the physical flesh and the heart of Jesus is the same as the renting of the Holy of Holies. He talks about our body is the temple of the Most High. And that's why there's no need of a physical temple anymore because we became the temple of God. The spirit that allows us to exist is the one who said, let there be light. The soul literally marries the spirit of the Most High when we become, quote, saved and become our will becomes subservient to the Creator and we become no longer temporal beings but eternal ones. So what Jesus did was open up and by renting the Holy of Holies, he opened up the pathway to develop a relationship with God again as fallen man. And that's pretty dramatic. It's not like any other religion. You don't have to do anything to be good enough for God. In fact, all you have to do is just show up. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was I was in a backpacker's lodge uh, uh, overseas one day, and I was talking about what Jesus did. And this young lady said, "Well, wasn't the cross just a gimmick?" And I said, "What do you mean?" He says, "Well, if he was about to die anyway, then why allow himself to be nailed publicly to a cross?" And she said, I almost feel sorry for those priests. It's like God willed it, so they had to act their guilty part, like they were victims of fate. No, they were not victims of fate, I told her. They didn't have to do what they did. Jesus had done everything possible to save them from playing their part in this terrible deed, but they freely chose their course of action, but God overruled it to his purpose that he had planned. And uh, I gave two reasons. I said the undisputed evidence that the sacrifice had been made, the fact that Jesus was hung publicly meant that witness of it could be borne without a shadow of doubt to the world and it would become a pivot of history. And this is why we know more about the details of those hours leading up to the crucifixion and death of Jesus, Jesus than we know about the death of any other person in the ancient world. Right. And, uh, of course, we even have it cited in first century statements from uh, Roman and Jewish uh, leaders. But the second reason I think is more important, the cross was overruled to reach men's hearts. Uh, Jesus made that wonderful prophecy. He said, if I be lifted up, lifted up on the cross, I will draw all men unto me. And the cross became God's chosen means of drawing men and women to the wonderful love that he was demonstrating. Right. And there are four points that uh, I believe show that the crucifixion was uh, was valid and was necessary and it accomplished what it was intended to do. The first one was to point out that sin must be a tremendously important matter. Why? Because it required the death of God himself in the flesh. But when does the doctor operate? He operates when there's hope, not when it's hopeless. And so this is a message that sin is neither hopeless nor incurable. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have died. But he himself had to come right down into it. God himself must come into it if it's to be beaten. Right. The, the second uh, victory of the cross was that it proved his love. It answered the question as to whether the Creator had sufficient love for us to exercise self-denial and a spirit of sacrifice so that we could be saved. And all he endured, it was for me, it was for you, for every listener there. It was from his love for us. He endured the penalty of divine justice for each one of us, and his death definitely proves his love. The, thing, the third thing that it accomplished, I believe, is it proved which of the two cared. Because for thousands of years, the forces of evil had been in a tussle for the control of the human race. And uh, Satan himself, cast out of heaven, and his, and his uh, horde, shifted his battlefield to earth, led our first parents into rebellion, told them they didn't need God, just go it alone, and we fell for it. Yeah, decide for yourself what is good or evil. In other words, you don't need to pray, you don't need to consult God, you don't need to listen to the Spirit, which is God, inside you that allows you to exist. You simply, your own soul can decide what is good or evil, which is the basis of uh, all the satanic religions. Do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Yeah. And when the rebellion began, it seemed incredible that sin could be as dangerous as God said it was. But as the universe sees the centuries of hatred, heartache, and death on planet Earth, 
understanding dawns. Satan's kingdom is demonstrated in operation, and then they see God's Son enter this enemy territory to save mankind and live and suffer for us, showing us how to overcome, and then dying for us. Satan's unquenchable hatred to him was unveiled in a way uh, in which he operated against Jesus. And so now Satan appears hideous. He's committed such a horrible crime against heaven. The last link of sympathy with him is broken. He's finished as far as the universe is concerned. He's revealed his true character as a liar and a murderer. Lucifer is discredited. Jesus Christ is vindicated. That's a triumph. And that's the third accomplishment out of four that I believe occurred at the cross. Right. The fourth one was that Jesus' death established divine law and established it. It satisfied the divine law, rather, because the law said, break me, you die. Jesus did not break the law. He died. We, we deserve to die. He took our place. So it satisfied the, the penalty of the law. He took that on himself. And it also established the law as unchangeable. You know, I hear a lot of preachers these days saying the law was abolished at the cross and in all this nonsense, uh, that the law is not eternal. It was only for the Jews that it was abolished at the cross. Uh, just love one another, that's all. Whereas Jesus himself said that the law is summed up in love to God and love to man. And if you just look at the Ten Commandments alone, you see the first four is love to God, the last six is love to man. And Jesus said it hangs like two pictures on the hooks of love to God and love to man. That's the law. It's, it's uh, experienced in our lives as a demonstration of our love in response to his love. And one of the things that Jesus did on the cross, people should understand this, is one of the great heresies that's entered the church is the millennialism. And there is no millennium, if, uh, because there will not be, as it says in Daniel, there will not be a time when the stone cut out with those hands, which is Yeshua, strikes the statue of uh, the prophecy of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of kings, which is a blasphemous title given by the king of Babylon, prophesied by Daniel, that that kingdom will be swept away. In other words, the time that started this week, this tabernacles, which refers back to the physical body of Jesus, is the time when also the last seven years, the time of trouble starts. So in some future tabernacles, the Jews will start a blood sacrifice and a divided state of Israel, which is a blasphemy against God. And uh, the whole world will be in a state of consternation, trying to amalgamate all these Abrahamic places together and say, yeah, you're still worshipping the same God, the God of Mecca Medina, which is a war god of the moon, uh, is the same God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jesus. Not. Not. And what's going to happen when this happens is the world will try to paste together these things because they're so fearful of what's coming upon the earth. They'll have this false religion that they'll try to force down everybody's throat along with a cashless economic system. And what Jesus did is he put the chains and cast out of heaven Lucifer. He no longer has access. And that kingdom will never rise again. You'll never see a millennium where the Satan and all and will, and his horde will rise again because once these last seven years occur and are culminated and mankind is saved from this destruction, it'll never rise again. And it was accomplished 2,000 years ago that coming back is very soon because the time of trouble in Israel is at the doors very, very soon. Amazing discussion today. And of course, coming up in chapter 33 next week, the rescuer accepted prophecy that saved many lives. Back in two weeks, Jonathan Gray tomorrow, Hardy Schlanger from the Roosh Foundation and 